Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see each and every one of you. We're always thankful for the opportunities that we have to worship God in spirit and truth. If you're visiting with us, we're certainly very glad that you've come our way. And we have multiple visitors with us, very thankful for uh, your presence. And we are so thankful that you had uh, safe travels to be with us here today. So thankful for our song leading, so thankful for the prayer and also the scripture reading. Uh, it was such a pleasure to uh, attend the uh, marriage workshop over the weekend. Uh, it was well attended, and many hands went into that. Many uh, hands were dropping off food before the day started, and we had people in and out and people that attended, and we had technology help, and we had people at the facilities helping, uh, and we're just thankful for each and every one. Any event like that cannot be accomplished with just a few, and we're thankful for each and every one that, that took part here at Sandyville and helped that initiative uh, by support and, and all the different ways that events can be uh, supported. So we're just very thankful for that. You know, we have so many in the congregation that are sick, and, and we certainly need to keep all of those uh, in our minds and certainly uh, in our prayers. And I have a, a special request this morning in terms of uh, other work that we're doing. Uh, we have a couple Bible studies going on in the community. We have Bible studies going on at people's homes, and we have a Bible study that's going to be happening at a, a nursing home as well. We ask you to keep these efforts in your prayers. Uh, certainly prayer is a powerful thing, but we're doing the best we can to get the word out, and certainly prayer is going to help us along the way. But one thing I know that these Bible studies that we have going are not going to last forever. That's just the nature of Bible study, uh, because we certainly want to... Uh, end with conversion, Lord willing, uh, with these Bible studies, but there's certainly other people in your lives that I want you to start thinking about, because we are going to have uh, an evangelism series after the gospel meeting, and we're going to start thinking about people that we can reach out to and teach the word to, and I don't know about you, I wasn't trained in evangelism. You say, what, you're a preacher, you weren't trained in evangelism. The only training I've had is God's word, and I think that all of us collectively as a family can be better, and I think I can be better as well. And certainly we're looking for opportunities to be better. And if you have anyone that you know would like to study with us, we certainly are trying to get into every door that we can. Whether it's at their home, whether it's the nursing home, wherever people are open to the gospel, we certainly want to uh, have those studies. So certainly keep us in, our, in your prayers as we have two active studies going on and certainly hope for the best in those cases. If you turn your Bibles over to 2 Peter chapter 3, that's where we're going to be spending our time this morning. Peter writing to Christians. And in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, we're going to try to look at verses 1 through 14. Peter has a message for the Christians. He wants them to not forget certain things in relation to the second coming of God. Now, I really want to emphasize that point that I believe 2 Peter is written to Christians. And I think that it should be taken from that perspective. Is These are things that Peter wants Christians to be reminded of in relation to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Certainly we know what the Bible says on such a subject, although there are many teachings on it. We know that every eye will see. As it says in Revelations chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. When Jesus comes back, it's not going to be a secret. Jesus will be seen. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Everyone will see the Lord Jesus when he returns. Certainly uh, those that are, are living. And we have this idea in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. It says there's going to be a shout from heaven, the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. When Jesus comes back, it will not be a surprise. When that day comes, all will come to an end. The question is, are we ready? Jesus wants us to be ready for the day of the Lord, the day that the Lord certainly returns. The Bible uh, is leading us in that direction. And certainly when we think of Jesus' goal in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, it said, For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. The intention of our Lord is that we're all prepared for that day when he returns. And, and as we think about the, the letter that we have before us in 2 Peter, 2 Peter writing, uh, Peter writing a letter to Christians, and really, as we kind of investigate some of the context, these Christians have a hard time. They're going through struggles. They have adversities. They have trials and tribulations. They're going through some things. So it's not an accident that once we get to chapter 3, really, Peter is trying to remind those Christians of certain things in relation to the second coming. 
If we look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28, it says, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Jesus is coming again. And Jesus, when he comes again, it will not be a secret. You know, we know that Jesus is coming, but we do not know the time. And in fact, when we read Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, it says, But the day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. The day is coming. But as so many things in this life, days that are coming, that have not come yet, a lot of times individuals get anxious. And a lot of times individuals will pick fun. And actually I think that's what Peter is going to try to do in 2 Peter chapter 3, is he knows that Christians are going to take a little bit of heat from the world. And people are going to say in front of the world, hey, Jesus hasn't come yet. And Peter really is encouraging them to stay faithful because that day is coming. We don't know when that day will come, but we know that day is coming. We don't know the day, we don't know the hour, but that day will come. Are you prepared for that day? Are you ready? What did Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 3, what are some things he tried to tell those Christians about the second coming? As they were going through life, as they were going through adversity, struggles, persecutions, as they were facing life, what were some things that he wanted to remind them of in relation to the second coming of Jesus? As we start to look in 2 Peter chapter 3, let's see what it says. Number one, I think Peter was trying to tell the Christians, trying to tell the church, he was trying to tell them, don't forget the past. Because the past is a great teacher. And he is going to bring something to their remembrance that they can remember, that they can associate with the situation that they find themselves in. I'm going to read the first seven verses there. It says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir, uh, I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the, the, the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continued as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and uh, the earth standing out of water in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of uh, ungodly men. In those first seven verses, Peter points out the fact that individuals are going to make fun of Christians. They're going to scoff at Christians. These Christians are saying that Jesus is coming back. And he says, you know what? You are going to be ridiculed. There's going to be scoffers. There are going to be people that say, you know what? Jesus isn't coming back. And you know what? Peter says, I want you to think about the past. Christians, I want you to think about the past for a moment. I want you to think about a situation that was very similar to the situation that you find yourselves in. Is God has said something is going to happen, and God is just waiting for that day. And you know what I think uh, in 2 Peter he tries to bring up is the idea of the flood. We have that idea of, of water. And we have that idea unfold by which, uh, as we see in there, we see the idea of, of water, the heaven, uh, the earth created, the world created, but it says they're being flooded with water. You know, our situation is kind of similar to Noah. Is we have Noah in Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, we see Noah's situation. The world has turned evil. They are lustful. Their minds are on evil continually. They've turned away from God. And you know what? God comes to Noah and says... You know what? There's a flood coming. And I believe Noah tries to preach that message and he prepares an ark. And I think Noah tries to preach that message. And the people in Noah's day, what did they do to Noah? They scoffed and said, there's no flood coming. There's no flood coming. We don't need to worry about this. We don't need to prepare our lives. We don't need to change anything. We're fine just the way we are. We don't have to worry about it. You know, we're kind of in a similar situation. Is God, through the Holy Scriptures, has told us about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we know, based off the Scriptures, that Jesus will return. Jesus will come back. And we're just waiting. We are waiting 
on the return of our Lord. As it starts in 2 Peter chapter 3, he says, I want to remind you. He says, Beloved, now I write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. He wants to remind them of past, of the past and similar circumstances. He wants to remind them that God keeps his promises. If God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. And he says, you know what, your situation, I believe he's trying to make this comparison, is that your situation is a lot like Noah's. When Noah was preparing the ark and trying to get everything ready, people scoffed. When Noah was trying to get everything prepared, people ridiculed. When Noah was trying to get ready, people ignored Noah. But Noah was getting ready because God said a flood was coming. The question for ourselves is, is how do we handle ourselves in such a situation? It says that there's going to be a time of scoffers. It says in verse 3, it says, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of the coming? You know, very similar to Noah, they said, Where is this flood that you speak of? Can this flood even happen? This is, this is not something that's going to, to uh, manifest. And certainly as we turn back to Genesis chapter 6, we see all these things that the Bible tells us about Noah's situation. You know, I believe if you try to, you know, we have probably 1,500 years till the flood uh, as you try to make those calculations and you try to go, you got 1,500 years till Noah, rather. And, and, and really, the world has turned away from God. If you look in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, it says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You know, in Ecclesiastes, it says there's nothing new under the sun. And I'm not saying our days are as bad as Noah's, but there's a lot of similar things. There's similar things. When we look out in the world, do we see wickedness? Do we see corruption? Do we th see a world that, that has turned their backs on God and said, you know what, I'm going to live life the way that I want to live. And when you say that there is a day coming that I will be accountable, when you say that there's a day out here that I will have to give an answer, I'm going to ignore that and I will ridicule you. I will mock you. And Peter's saying, just remember the past. Your situation is not that much different than Noah. Your situation is not that much different than Noah. Noah was told that something would happen and he waited and he prepared himself while everyone else was ridiculing so Peter, when he's talking to Christians, he says, remember the past. Remember the God that we serve. Remember other things that we can learn about from the past. And certainly Genesis chapter 6 is powerful in that respect. In Matthew chapter 24, the situation of Noah is brought up again. And it's brought up in relation to this idea of Jesus returning, the coming of the Son of Man. In Matthew chapter 24... Verses 37 through 39, the Bible says this. It says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Peter says, I know... Brothers and sisters in Christ, the situation that you're in. You're living a life based off a promise of God. You're living your life based off a promise of God that has not been fulfilled yet. But God has fulfilled his promises in the past. Just look back to Noah. God told Noah that a flood would come. And actually, I think that we have a lot of evidence that a global flood has, has happened and occurred. It takes very special circumstances to make fossils. If an animal just dies alongside the road, it doesn't become a fossil. We have fossil graveyards all over the world. We have fossils that are on top of the highest peaks and mountains. I think there's a lot of evidence of a global flood. In fact, I've heard people say if the Bible didn't talk about a global flood, that would be the conclusion of, of every individual just looking at the evidence. God said a flood was coming, and you know what? A flood came. And I think Peter is trying to encourage the Christians and say, you know what, you're living a faithful life. You're living a life based off God's promise, and God, the God that we serve, fulfills His promises. Look back to Noah. And what are these scoffers going to say? 
It's interesting how uh, Matthew chapter 24 and 2 Peter chapter 3, they really parallel very well because the scoffers are going to say, you know what, everything is just kind of going as it always went. People are marrying, people are eating, their normal lives are continuing. You know what, that was just like the flood. It was just normal days. You know, the second coming of Jesus is going to be very similar like that. You know, Jesus could come on your wedding day. Very possible. Jesus could come while you're, you're working. Jesus could come at any time. He could come today. It's just another day. And that was like the day of the flood. And Peter is trying to encourage these Christians and say, you know what, the God that we serve keeps his promises. It will be business as usual, but the question is, is are you ready for such a day? Noah is ready. He prepared, and he prepared his household based off of faith. He heard what God said, and he did that. He did what God said. He prepared the ark, and we can read in Hebrews chapter 11, those individuals with faith, they heard what God said, and they did it. The question is, is Noah heard what God said, and he prepared an ark? The question for us today is, are we preparing ourselves for the second coming of Jesus? Are we ready? Are we ready for the return of our Lord? You know, you read down through there, that idea that look to the past. We serve a God that keeps his promises. We serve a God that said the world would be flooded with water, and that's exactly what happened. You understand that this will be a day of no escape. When Jesus returns, are you ready? You know, don't get too attached to this world. As you look in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works of it will be burned up. Don't get too attached to this world. We are here but strained pilgrims. We're not going to be here forever. Noah was getting that ark ready because he knew the flood was coming. And we as Christians know that Jesus is coming back to take us to a prepared place. And we need to be ready. We can't get too attached to this world. This whole world and the works of it are going to be burned up. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 15 it says, And he said to them, Beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist of the abundance of things one possesses. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, it says the world is passing away. You know that this world is going to be destroyed? Houses, cars, materialistic things, all these things are going to be burned up. Every single thing. We should be clinging to those things that are eternal and everlasting. And God's words are eternal and everlasting. His promises are eternal and everlasting. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 7, it says we brought nothing into this world and it's certain that you're going to carry nothing out. We kind of come in naked and we kind of leave naked. You're not going to be taking too much with you. There's nothing that you can take. And as it says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, all is going to be burned up, all is going to be consumed. First, when Peter starts talking about the second coming of Jesus and he starts to encourage Christians, he says, think about the past. We serve a God who keeps his promises. You understand that we serve a God that keeps his promises? In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, we, we really should be more like God in many ways. And, and the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 37, it says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. When God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. When God says he's not going to do that, he's not going to do that. And we know that there's a lot of conditions that we can see throughout the Holy Scriptures. God says, uh, when, when the children of Israel are going into the promised land, He says, if you're obedient, I'll bless you. But He says, if you're disobedient and you worship false gods, He says, I'm going to curse you. God means what He says. Let our yes be yes and our no be no. God means what He says and Jesus is going to return. Just look to the past. We can learn so much from the Old Testament. The Old Testament was for our learning. As it says in Galatians chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, it says it was our tutor to bring us to Christ, to bring us to faith. We can learn many things from the Old Testament. One thing that we can learn from the Old Testament is the consistency of God. God kept his promises in the Old Testament. When he said, I'll give you a land, he gave them a land. 
When he says, I will deliver you, I will, he delivered them. When he says, I'll get you out of Egypt, he got them out of Egypt. When God says it, it is a promise and it is the same and it will not be broken. In fact, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18 says it's impossible for God to lie. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18, it says it's impossible for God to lie. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, it says this, In hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time began. God who cannot lie promised before time began. Se uh, Peter, talking to Christians, and he says, You know what? The second coming of Jesus, look to the past. Because in the past, you will see that God keeps his promises. And if God has said that he will return, if Jesus says he will return, he will. And the question is, is are we ready? As we continue in 2 Peter chapter 3, those first seven verses, I think that is the idea that, that is really trying to be uh, uh, put across to them is that we can look to the past and we can learn some things about the God which we serve. There are many things that we can learn about the God which we serve. And from that, we can be in a better position in relation to serving God and keeping our perspective in the right place. As we continue on, I think we're going to see another idea that Peter brings up to them, and it's the idea that Jesus will come back, number one, because you look to the past, he promised he would come back. Number two, have you ever thought about why Jesus hasn't come back? Well, I think Peter answers that question in the next few verses. Verses 8 and following, it says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know what? If you think about the second coming, Peter says, I want you to think about the past, because the God we serve keeps his promises. When you think about the second coming, I want you to think about God is patient. You know why God hasn't returned? He's trying to give people an opportunity. He's trying to give an opportunity to the people that we're studying with. He's trying to give them an opportunity to hear his word. You know, I'm thankful for the time that God gave me to study the word and come to a knowledge of the truth. I'm thankful for the time that God gave me. You understand that God hasn't returned because God does have this aspect to himself of patience. And we can see that in the Old Testament. God was patient. Now, there's the goodness and the severity of God, but the God we serve is patient. It says, Beloved, do not forget. Number one, Christians, don't forget the past. Don't forget God keeps his promises. Number two, Christians, don't forget that time is not the same with us and God. Time's a little bit different with God. And it tells us there, the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. But just because God's time and our time, see, in our time, everything has a start and an end. God is eternal. God is eternal. God doesn't view time the same way that we do, so a lot of time has passed, and we're like, Jesus should come. But God doesn't view time the same as, same as we do. So people look to God and they say, you know what? God is not going to keep his promise. It's been a long time. It tells us there in verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us. God, just because a long time has passed, doesn't mean God's not going to keep his promise. A long time has passed because God is long-suffering. God is patient. He wants to give every opportunity to any individual. I know individuals that become Christians when they're close to death. I know Christians that become uh, individuals that become Christians in the middle of their life. I know people that become Christians in their youth. People become Christians at all different points in their life, and we're thankful for God's patience. God is long-suffering. God doesn't want any to perish. You understand that God's trying to give you time. God's trying to give me time. He's trying to give the lost time that they can study the scriptures and come to a knowledge of the truth. Are we thankful for that? You know, if you continue on to chapter 3 and verse 15, we're in the chapter. Chapter 3 and verse 15, it says this. Consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Instead of long-suffering there, I'm going to put patience. Consider that the patience of our Lord is salvation. You understand that every day that God waits, every day that the second coming is delayed, is an opportunity of salvation for someone. 
brothers and sisters in Christ, Peter is trying to get a message across. Number one, brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus, God, made a promise. Look to the past. He's going to keep it. Number two, think about it. God has delayed his coming because he desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. He's long-suffering. He is patient. And we are thankful for the patience of the God that we serve. I'm thankful for the patience of God. So Peter's saying, you know what? When you think about the second coming, think about God keeps his promises. Think about the past. Number two, he says, you know what? Think about God's patience. You know, God hasn't returned because he really desires all to be saved and all to come to a knowledge of the truth. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, it says God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And, and here we kind of have the echoing of that similar idea in, in verse 9. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't want people to perish. He wants them to repent and change their lives. Number one, when you think about the second coming, think about the past. God keeps his promises. Number two, when you think about Jesus and the second coming, think about his patience. He's trying to give people opportunity to study the word and come to a knowledge of the truth. And number three, he's going to talk about the attitude we should have because God's coming again. Because Jesus is coming again. What would be the right attitude? We know that there's a promise that we have, a promise that we're clinging on to, that Jesus is coming again. We understand that Jesus is being patient and he's trying to give opportunities to individuals. We're holding on to this promise. We're understanding the patience of God. We're holding on to that promise. How should we live our lives based off the second coming of Jesus? I think he's going to tell us here. In verses 11 through 13. Verse 10 we already read, the idea of everything being destroyed and burned up. 11 through uh, 13. It says, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for the hastening, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. You understand that this whole world is going to be destroyed, but it's going to be replaced. It's going to be replaced with new heavens, new earth, a place for God's people, a place for the righteous. But verse 11, it, it, I think, is a powerful verse because you can feel the transition. It says, therefore, therefore what? Therefore, because God keeps his promises. Therefore, because God is patient. Therefore, because God is coming again. All those things that have been said. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, the world's going to be destroyed, what manner of persons ought we to be? We should be holy in conduct and godliness. We should be people of God. We should be following God's word and trying to live the best life that we can, a faithful life to our God who gave his life for us. Do you have the right attitude about the second coming? Are you trying to live the best life that you can, trying to serve the Lord and do those things that are good and right? So it says, hey, we need to live a good life, holy conduct and godliness. Look at verse 12. It says, looking for the hastening and the coming day of the Lord because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. It says there, it says, looking for and hastening the coming day of God. Are you looking for the day of God? Are you hastening the day of God? Do you want that day to come? If you're a Christian and you're prepared, you want that day to come. Because what a blessed day that will be where we will go to be with God in heaven. Do you live in anticipation of the coming of Jesus? Are you looking for his coming? I don't know if this is perfect, but when I thought about this, you know, looking for somebody to come, anticipating somebody to come, I think about my kids. I think kids might be the best example of this. You know, for the marriage workshop, we were very blessed that we had some family that helped out and watched our kids, Sarah's parents and my parents. So thankful for them uh, in that respect. Uh, and... When we told our kids that Grandma and Grandpa were coming, they were ready. <laughs> they were on the back of the couch. They were looking over, you know, and, we, and, and Friday was really hard because we told them Grandma and Grandpa is coming to watch them. They're just over the couch, and they're just walking, looking out the window. They are eagerly waiting. They are anticipating the grandparents coming. They want the grandparents there. They are eagerly waiting. You know what? Sometimes they're like that when I come home from work. Now, I know they probably aren't going to be like that forever. I know that. But I come home, and they shoot up off the couch. 
Their hands shoot up and they go, Daddy, Daddy, he's home. They are eagerly anticipating me coming home. They're like, what time is it? What time is Dad going to be home? They're, they're eagerly anticipating. Are we like that with God? Do we want God to come? Do we want to embrace? Do we want to go to that place that God has prepared? Are we eagerly waiting? Are we looking for and hastening the coming day of the Lord? Don't forget the right attitude because I think that's the attitude that the Scriptures teach. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20 it says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you eagerly waiting for the second coming? Are you eagerly waiting? Are you trying to live the best life that you can? Are you ready? You know, unfortunately, the day of the Lord is going to be very special for some, and for some it's going to be a dark day. You know, Amos tries to get that point across. Amos, a minor prophet of the Old Testament. In Amos chapter 5, he talks about the day of the Lord. Of course, the day of the Lord in terms of the judgment for those people. But the day of the Lord can be a great day, but it also is going to be a bad day for some individuals. In chapter 5 and verse 18, he says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord, for what good is the day of the Lord to you? You know, there's a lot of individuals that think they're prepared. They think they're ready. And it's unfortunate. And that's why evangelism and trying to get the gospel out is so important. Because we have to get into the word of God. We've, we've got to read the Bible. Because the way that we get prepared for the coming of Jesus is listening to his words. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do the things that I say? There in 2 Peter chapter 3 it says we know God's coming. What should we do? We should live a good life. We should follow the teachings of the Bible. We should be getting into that. But that's powerful words, and you can actually read chapter 5. I don't think you can get much more powerful. Of course, Amos, he was a farmer. He lays it down pretty straight. But he says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord, for what good is the day of the Lord to you? People think they're ready. Are you ready? In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 and following, it says, Many on that day will say to me, Lord, Lord. Or rather, it says, uh, as we go to Matthew chapter 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Would you do the will of the Lord? Are you ready? Are you ready for such a day? You know, I want to go to heaven. I believe it's a prepared place for a prepared people. Are you prepared? I think we see the pattern of the New Testament. Jesus dies. He's resurrected. He sends his, uh, his followers out, the apostles out. He tells them to baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And we see them carry out that message in Acts chapter 2. And the people hear the word, they believe, they repent, they confess, and they're baptized. Perhaps you need to become a New Testament Christian. Perhaps you need the prayers of the church. But the question for all of us is, are you ready? And are you eagerly anticipating the coming of the Lord? If not, you can fix that this day. And you can be ready. For his coming. What a glorious day that will be. If you're subject to the invitation, if you need the prayers of the church, we'd love to help you in any way that we can. If you come as we stand, as we sing.